Um, so first up is Dr. Rob Cunney, who's the National Clinical Lead for the Healthcare Associated Infection and Antimicrobial Resistant Clinical Mouthful Program. Next up is Dr. Vida Hamilton, who's um, a National Clinical Lead for the HSC Sepsis Program. Um, Dr. Nulo Connor is the ICGP Lead for the Prevention of Healthcare Associated Infections and Antibiotic Resistance. Dr. Michael Gardham, um, who is our second keynote speaker, Associate Professor of Medicine in the University of Toronto, and last, but very not least, Professor Martin Cormican, who's Professor of Bacteriology in NUI Galway. And Catherine de Martin is also around that if you have questions for her, and she's happy to take them. Um, I think we may have roving microphones. We do. So what I'd ask is if, that, if you have a question in general about the topic of antimicrobial resistance or using antibiotics wisely or questions about the presentations or, God help us, questions about the future that Cathy has painted to us, um, please ask. But just to kick the ball rolling, if that's okay, Philip, I was just going to ask Vida and put her on the spot because she puts me on the spot all the time. So, Vida, you gave a really good talk on, on sepsis that I missed, but I heard on the internet was great because I was speaking too. And one of our problems with potentially with the sepsis program is for sepsis, we're saying to everybody, sepsis to six, antibiotics in an hour, give them fast. And you've just heard the post-antibiotic apocalypse that we're facing for. So how have you managed in the program to balance those two complementary but potentially conflicting messages? Uh, well, for in the first point uh, I'd like to make is we always uh, use the terminology antimicrobial because sepsis can be caused by any manner of bug, be it viral, bacterial, fungal, or parasitic. So uh, we always use the terminology uh, antimicrobial. But secondarily, every single presentation I've ever made uh, as part of this program, I talk about the start, smart, then focus approach uh, to antimicrobial therapy. And um, rather than um, promoting broad spectrum antimicrobials for all uh, who are presenting with sepsis, um, we target the site, the source, and then taking into uh, consideration uh, patient issues such as allergy or known colonization status. So what we're very much interested in is developing a rational approach, um, a thoughtful, evidence-based approach to treating patients with antimicrobials, and that's what we're, we're trying to promote. And Rob? I, I, actually, uh, just to, to, to second that, I, I, um, I, I, some of you may have been at Andrew Seaton's presentation in uh, uh, the College of Physicians um, uh, last week, uh, where he was showing the experience from, from Scotland, uh, where they've very much taken that same approach. And what they've done is they've really focused on going for, um, uh, you know, again, focusing on identifying the cause of, se of sepsis, going with narrow spectrum antibiotic choices, um, very much built around uh, gentamicin-based uh, uh, therapies. And what they found as a, a result of that is that, first of all, they have cut their C. diff rates uh, dramatically, but they've also cut their mortality uh, due to gram-negative sepsis. So they've really shown that you know, there, is, there tends to be this instinct that, oh, if it's sepsis, therefore we've got to reach for the Godzilla psyllin. Uh, but you actually don't need to, that, that uh, in fact, using, using sort of narrower spectrum, uh, what we sometimes think of as almost old-fashioned antibiotics, but using them correctly, uh, you end up saving lives. And, and I also noted in the sepsis report, you've got some balancing measures. Yeah, that yeah that's right. Um, in all of um, our sepsis reports from here on in, we'll be looking at um, antimicrobial usage to see if there are any changes in patterns so that we can pick them up promptly and address them if they're not in the right direction. Um, and the other thing then is looking at um, rates of um, multi-resistant organisms and um, C. diff outbreaks uh, to see if uh, there is any negative impact um, from the program. And you know, should one become apparent, then we would look to intervene and address it straight away. 
The other thing is by having a mechanism where we have a local um, sepsis committee in each hospital, that if individual issues arise within a hospital, there's a mechanism for that to be addressed locally before it becomes a, a major problem. So we're trying to create a network that's very sensitive and very responsive um, to, to the changing dynamics that is sepsis uh, in terms of our understanding of it and our treatment of it. Thank you, and I think that's very important because it's often a criticism laid at, as well as any national sepsis programme, and you've addressed that. Philip. Uh, thanks, for that. Yeah, Philip Crowley, uh, National Director of Quality Improvement. Thanks, Michael, for uh, super presentation um, and uh, you know also I think for the generosity of your approach in Ireland where you've come over as you say we told you to do it in six months rather than 18 months that was probably my fault and uh, but just the generosity of your approach that you've kind of you've left behind a, a significant legacy in terms of you know us understanding ownership and us uh, using the kind of skills and tools that you've pioneered uh, in all kinds of ways, so I really appreciate the contribution you made to our efforts, so I'd like to note that. Uh, my question is really for everybody is, you know, I'm, I'm on the National Task Force uh, around, um, you know, multi-drug resistant organisms as a number of uh, the couch participants are, uh, and we don't want to be on the couch on this issue, so I'm just wondering, uh, what, what, what's the panel's view as to, how, you know, how, how far down the road to the apocalyptic vision that Cathy laid out for us are we, in fact? Great. Martin. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Fidelma. I'm not sure that I buy into the apocalyptic vision quite in the way that some people portray it, um, at least not in any immediate. So an antibiotic resistance, um, I don't see it likely that we're going to have sort of masses. I won't say there will be cases, but I don't think we're going to see masses of otherwise healthy people dying of bacterial infection um, because of antibiotic resistance. I think what we're already seeing, and what's going to get worse, is vulnerable people dying of organisms that probably wouldn't bother you and I. So in terms of the antibiotic resistance, I, I, the biggest issue for me at the moment is carbapenemase producing intrabacteriaceae. This is something we might still be able to manage. But the reality is that if every one of you in this room got carbapenemase producing intrabacteriaceae today, probably none of you would get sick, most likely, because you're otherwise healthy, or most of you are. But if you do that to the same number of people who have acute leukemia or who have had recent complex surgery, then a high proportion of those people are going to die. So what the apocalypse, in the sense that I see, isn't masses of healthy people dying. What I see is the people who we can save now, we will not be able to help then, and they will have much worse outcomes. And that isn't the future, it's now. Any dissenters, Michael? Um, no, not really dissenting. I think that... Um Certainly when I started infectious diseases 20 years ago, it was very unusual to see these highly drug resistant organisms and now they're, they're popping up fairly frequently. And it makes me worry, as, as you were just saying, it makes me worry about all of those things in modern medicine that we currently do, bone marrow transplants, chemotherapy, complex surgeries, those are all relying on us being able to treat the infections that are going to possibly be coming down the road. And I've certainly had patients on my, on my, my clinical service that we've been un, unable to treat, mm. which is, would, would, would have been unheard of 20 years ago. Mm. Um, so, you know, is it an apocalypse? And, and I think in, in certain populations, we're slowly walking that way. I do have to comment that the, the, the stories you were reading gave me SARS flashbacks. And, uh, I didn't want to say I that. have to bill somebody <laughs> for my therapy that I'm going to need after hearing those. Um, <laughs> But, but that, 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 that sense that we're going closer and closer to that, I, I think it is, it's, it's slow, but it seems to be happening, and certainly in certain populations. Rob, are you going to dissent? The, uh, yes and no. Oh, I mean, I oh. think it's, uh, <laughs> uh, again, I, I, I don't think it's, it's likely to be as apocalyptic, although, again, we are, we are talking about organisms that have been around longer than any of us. They're the, you know, they've been around longer than any other life form on this planet. They have an ability to evolve uh, that, that far outstrips ours. So um, we, don't know what they, we don't know what the microorganisms are going to do next or how they're going to evolve. And for example, you know, in, if you look at you know, sort of the, kind of in the, kind of the microbiology infectious disease literature over the last uh, you know, 10, 20 years, as Martin says, it's gram-negatives, gram-negatives, gram-negatives. They're, they're the real superbugs. That, that, uh, but 
at the same time, Neisseria gonorrhea, the clap, is actually has suddenly surged ahead as perhaps being the first great untreatable bacterial plague, and so is TB. And it's those organisms. Mm -hmm. It's while you know, and I, I agree with, with with Michael that you know that this is going to have a huge impact on hospital medicine. Um, but it's those other organisms that are coming up, like TB, like uh, like uh, um, like Gonococcus, like Salmonella, that are actually going to have a much greater impact, I think, outside of the hospitals in community practice. And what we're, they're not necessarily, I think, in, at least in this part of the world, going to result in a huge increase in mortality, but they are going to result in a huge increase in morbidity. You're mm -hmm. going to see a lot more people where, as in the pre-antibiotic era, gonorrhea was a chronic, you know, debilitating disease that resulted in chronic osteomyelitis and 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 uh, you know and, and lots of other, and, and you know lots of other um, associated infections, um, and I think that's sort of the picture that we're going to see. So it's not going to be, I think, a huge apocalypse, as so much as just a, a gradual assault on our overall health and our ability to deliver healthcare. Now, since none of you are dissenting, Nula, can I put it to you? Would you go on a ski trip? Not that, I'm not suggesting you're not a fabulous skier, <laughs> but if we'd no antibiotics for your orthopedic surgery. So do you not think antibiotic resistance threatens the, the way we live our lives? So we're pretty cavalier these oh, days. Oh, I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think what we have to do is I think we have to um, kind of go back to and remind ourselves of the pre-antibiotic era. Um, so prior to the introduction of penicillin in 1945, if you look um, at um, a, a sort of disease records and death records from then, uh, in Ireland, you know, it was very common for people to have maybe eight or nine or, or ten children. It was also very common for two or three of those children to die, you know, to die from diseases which we are now able, able to treat. Um, and if you look at um, all cause mortality um, in the last century, while you know we're all aware of all the fantastic um, advancements that we've had in treatments of cancer, treatments of cardiovascular disease, treatments of chronic respiratory conditions, but when you look at the graphs, the graphs for them sort of go a little bit like this. The graph for infectious disease goes like this. And that comes in 1945 with the introduction of, of, of penicillin. And, and there were even war posters for the First World War. Thanks to penicillin, he will come home. So, you know, like it, it, it's hard now to imagine a world without antibiotics. Um, and, and I think I would agree that there'll be a lot of us that may not be affected by it for a good part of our lives. But if we like that have to have an orthopedic op operation if we have to have any kind of an operation if 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 we're unlucky enough or one of our loved ones unlucky enough to develop cancer and you, you know there, there are an awful lot of people i work as a gp i mean i have a huge amount of patients now who are walking around who are immunocompromised you know, they're on drugs which reduce their immune systems they have recovered from cancer but at the same time their immune systems are still suppressed um, and these are the people i think that are going to be really vulnerable um, in the future and yes, I would be worried about not having antibiotics to cover me if I had to have what is now considered a routine, you know, operation. Can I just come back in? Oh, you want to dissent sure. back, Mark? No, I don't want to dissent. I just want to discuss that. <laughs> I'm very preoccupied by this. Stuff. It's not the future. It's now. Yes. This is now. Yes. This isn't something five or ten years' time. People are already dying yes. with antibiotic-resistant organs that we cannot effectively treat. Yes. That's, I mean, it, so it's not, you know, it, it's now. Uh, it's been happening for years, and we haven't been doing enough about it. Yeah, yeah I mean, the figures in Europe are that uh, uh, currently 25,000 people die each year from these multidrug-resistant bugs. And, uh, and if we do nothing, and if we continue on our current trajectory, um, it's estimated by 2050 that it will be 10 million deaths worldwide. So it's going to outstrip cancer deaths. And in Europe, it's going to be 390,000 deaths. So, like, these are, you know, these are very, very frightening numbers. Um, and I, I think certainly my opinion, and I think it's probably the collective opinion of everyone sitting on this couch, is that the powers that be in this country are not taking this seriously. You know, it was interesting to hear um, um, uh, Christine's talk about, uh, you know, in Europe, kind of looking what countries have got 
strategies, what countries have action plans. A lot of people have strategies and action plans, but you can have all the plans in the world and all the big fancy documents. But if you don't have the resources to implement it on the ground, to do the frontline ownership, to make those changes and get everyone engaged, then we can't actually do what we need to do to bring us back from whether we're on the brink of the apocalypse or not. Uh, we're, we're sort of teetering over there and we need to be brought back. But that requires this problem to be taken seriously by everybody. And it's not just one person that's going to do it. Mm. I mean, every single person um, in this room and in this country has to, has to take their part. Patients need to understand what they need to do. We as doctors need to understand, industry needs to understand, the veterinary world uh, needs to understand. So it's, it's, this is something that's not going to be solved by any one particular discipline. Um, it really is something that requires a, a societal effort. So it all sounds like one of these wicked pro um, problems that somebody told me about um, earlier on. And in a way, do you not think that if it's so wicked and so bad, we may as well just leave now and give up and go for a drink? <laughs> um, like, Michael, you were telling us that there, there, there is hope you can do things. So this is a huge problem. We need to involve everybody. Yeah. So we're all going to go back to our own hospitals or healthcare facilities or primary care centres. What, what can we do to try and start... Well, I, changing things. I mean, I, I think the first thing is acknowledging that it is a, a, a true wicked or a um, true complex problem, that it's not something that you can solve by having a national guideline alone. These things are important, but they're not going to be, they're not going to be um, enough to, to get you to where you want to go. I mean, I liken it very much to global climate change in that it's a multi-sector, multi-faceted problem that if any one group tries to tackle and nobody else gets on board, it's just going to fall flat. Mm -hmm. um, and until we're ready to acknowledge, to really acknowledge how big a challenge it is and get all the different players in the room, we can talk about antimicrobial stewardship all we want in the healthcare sector. In the meantime, in Canada at least, we're still pumping all of our animals full of antibiotics every day. Um, not much is going to change unless we can also tackle that at the same time. Any thoughts from the floor? Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Dara Fahey. I'm the Director of Quality, Safety and Risk in Tala Hospital. Just had a question just about the frontline ownership and the discussion around resources. I'm just wondering how frequently in terms of you know, bringing together a group of people, perhaps ward staff, and you have a conversation yeah. around an issue, that at the end of it, they come up with solutions which they think they can embed in their own area or in their own ward, but ultimately they need resources. Maybe they're, they're looking at each other saying, well, who's actually going to do the work? Yeah. I'm just wondering how often you come away with that and what, what your response would be to something like that. Yeah, you know, what we found is by and large, um, there's always a few people who are very excited about working on something. Most people aren't. Most people are not engaged in this frontline ownership process at all, but there's always a couple that are. And if it requires them to do a little bit more work on something, they'll happily do it. There it's really about speaking to their manager to make sure that they have a bit of time freed up to be able to do that. Um, we've sort of estimated that probably two to three percent of the staff are actively engaged and the rest just go along for the ride. And so you, you don't need the whole gang in there all the time. And you also don't need to actually interact with them all that much. These are very small, subtle changes that occur over a period of months with a relatively small number of staff, but it, it, it seems to get you to where you need to go. And so we don't need to have everybody take a day off work and all come to the thing to be able to talk to them. We do all these exercises right in the ward, right, on, right in the nursing station, um, and they're very, very quick and yet you're able to get these quite remarkable changes just with those small, that, that small percentage that are actually involved. So they are able to do it, and it usually doesn't cost them any, any money in particular. You can actually set that as one of your overarching principles. If somebody says, we want to decrease pressure ulcers, and the way we want to do that is to spend 10 million euro on buying new beds for every patient, you can say, well, we actually don't have 10 million euro, so next. <laughs> we're, we're not going to spend our time ranting about how we don't have money for this. What can you do, what is within your power right now, at this moment, to decrease pressure ulcers? There's lots you can do besides buying a new bed. And so that's the kind of approach that we take. And it, um, 
it's, it's awkward and often uncomfortable and it feels like you're not getting anywhere and it's this, that's why we end up coaching people because it is, it is very kind of often difficult to get through but as you start to get through it, things start to happen. Just on a follow up, if I could then, you talked about removing boulders. They might say, well, my boulder is I just don't have the time to do it. You know, yeah. give me another staff nurse and yeah. we'll, we'll do it. Yeah, all the time. That is 100% all the time. <coughs> Somebody will say, we don't, we don't have resources, we don't have time to do this. And yet they do. Yeah. Uh, they always do, a few people do. And what I find remarkable is that somebody will tell you to, their, to your face, I have no time to work on this. But when you start listening to them, they'll still be yelling at you 45 minutes later <laughs> about how they have no time to work on this. And what I learned is that it's not about the time so much, it's that they're sick and tired of having ideas that nobody listens to. Yeah. And so if you actually engage them, they will find the time. We had people you know, spending an hour or two after work or even during work to work on those posters or do various things or actually pull together groups of people because they felt it was important because it was their idea. But they would never do that if I came to them with a PowerPoint deck and educated them. They would never engage in that way. I, mean, Thank you. I have to say, I mean, that has been, I mean, and, and, I, and I mean, I'm, I'm something of a, a, a neophyte when it comes to the, the front end ownership work, but I've found the same thing that like, it's when you actually, when you give people the opportunity to speak and to be listened to, it's the, 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 there's the sense of, of momentum that you get in the room and, and the, is, is tremendous. I mean, I had this experience of doing a, a, a workshop on, on hand hygiene improvement in a, um, it was actually in, in uh, Drogheda, and um, we had a we had the chief operating officer, we had the medical director, we had lots of high-powered people, we had nurses, we had do you know doctors, NCHD, and so forth. But we also had cleaners in the room, and um, we uh, used one, some of the frontline ownership techniques and these liberating structures that meant that everybody in the room got to talk to at least three other people about the subject of, of hand hygiene. And one of the things I asked at the end was like, has have any of the cleaners ever had the opportunity to speak to the medical director or the chief operating officer or indeed any doctor or nurse on this subject before? And the answer was no. And it turns out that, you know, of all the people in the room, they were the ones who best understood what needed to be done around the, the, the physical layout for hand hygiene. They were the ones who knew where the alcohol gel tests <coughs> needed to be because they were the ones who were actually on the wards more than anyone else. Um, and so the, um, and I've, I've seen this with, you know, with, we've done this with around antibiotic uh, prescribing in, in Temple Street, uh, around handover, um, and, uh, and also again with hand hygiene. And again, it's the same thing. Now, it's, sometimes it's frustrating because you kind of chip away and you chip away and it doesn't seem like there's a hell of a lot happening and you're starting to maybe see a little bit of improvement in one ward and it's, you're frustrated because you want everybody to be doing the same thing. But you've got to let it incubate. You've got to give it time. And you know, the, I mean, we've gone in, in Temple Street from not having a particularly good uh, record on hand hygiene to being consistently over 90% in both our national and local audits, wow. and including audits where people don't know they're being audited. Um, and I'd love to say that you know, I drove all of that. I didn't really. It sort of, it, it, you kind of planted the seeds and then you get this viral spread and it ended up, it was, it came down to competition between the individual wards with one ward going, well, we can't let that ward be the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the best in the place. And it's remarkable how you see the differences in culture between individual wards and even within one hospital, I mean, you give the example of the, you know, the Starbucks, Starbucks versus Tim Hortons thing. Yeah. I mean, in one small hospital in Temple Street, it's amazing how, an approach that worked in one ward, say the ICU, where they used um, you know, simulation training, versus another ward, the renal unit, where they used a, you know, unadulterated competition between everybody. They had a, they had a bottle of champagne as a prize. Um, you know, I, I, like, so a totally different approach in both wards, and what worked in one place wouldn't work in the ward next door. Um, so you, you really have to be conscious of the local culture and, and let the people on the ground determine what's going to work for them. Now, we haven't rehearsed this, but you're all looking a bit too comfortable for my liking. And Michael, one of the things you taught me is when people are looking too comfortable for their liking, you get them to do a bit of work. So, 
What, that one, two, four, all thing. Yeah. yeah. How do you think we'll do that? Do you want to? You want to do it here? And, I just, they're all looking a bit yeah. too comfortable now. Well, I want to wake them up a bit. Yeah. Sure. So Michael's going to explain what it is. Okay, so this is one of the liberating structures. What I'd like you to do, um, so it doesn't matter what your, your role, particular role is, I want you to take a moment on your own, so no talking, you're thinking. Um, what's one thing you could do to decrease antimicrobial resistance in your organization or in your role? What's one thing that's within your power? So don't tell me you're going to write the national guideline. What's one thing you could do right now that's in your power to decrease antimicrobial resistance. Take a minute to just think about that. So we'll let you do that now, and then I'll give you the next instruction. Just take a moment to think about that. So you're starting to experience some of the awkwardness that I'm talking about with these approaches. So now, <laughs> turn to the person beside you and have a roughly one to two minute conversation on each of your ideas. And then I'm going to yell, pair up, and then your pair and another pair are going to come together and the four of you are going to have a conversation. And so go ahead. And pair. presumably, Michael, apart from you, it means the other people on the couch too. Sure. Yeah. All right. Go for it. So go ahead and pair up. <laughs> you better get out of the way, Michael. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> You want to go first? Yeah. So at this point, um, now take your pair and pair up with another pair. So four of you chatting, or five for some of you that are mathematically uh, challenged. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'll have to bring you back a little bit, a little bit quickly. But that's giving you a sense of, of one of the liberating structures called one, two, four, all. And so I'm just curious. Um, if how that experience felt, if you heard anything interesting, it was very, it was a bit too quick, but we ran out of time. But just any thoughts, and I am trained to stare at you for 20 seconds <laughs> until one of you says something. Philip. Um, made them think about actually doing something. Yeah. Because they started to participate in it rather than listen to it. Yeah. Maybe yeah, that, maybe absolutely. That yeah. That, that, and that's, we're asking the question, what can you do right now? Because yeah. we'll very quickly get trapped by, I can't do anything, I'm not in charge of anything, blah, blah, blah. But you, there's still things that you can do that will impact upon this. And then the idea is, as you're sharing amongst your group, you may hear an idea similar to yours, and that idea may start to float to the surface because a bunch of people have that idea. Or your idea may have started off rough, but then it kind of gets sanded off and be, sort of becomes better as you start discussing it with people. And we, we all have different ideas, actually, as well, you know, oh, different perspectives. Perfect. Yeah. So then you're hearing different perspectives. So imagine if you were all different types of roles in the organization, when that's where Rob was saying you can get the, 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 the cleaner speaking with a, a senior medical leader, et cetera, which never would have happened before. And it's all about generating those ideas to be able to move forward. Any other comments? Can I just say, we, we share one that we think talking about, but I think that we're all uh, in agreement about. Um, and the thing that I have Can we get the mic on, Vita? The mic's not on. Oh, mic's coming your way. Hi, thank you. Um, so the, the thing that's within my power is I'm um, about to rewrite the uh, maternity sepsis information leaflet because the first version, the feedback was it was too scary. So I've <laughs> been giving it quite a lot of thought and I've completely changed my approach to it. And the way I'm going to approach it now is I'm going to talk about the fact that bugs are good, bacteria are good. We coexist with bacteria. We depend on bacteria to live. The, um, the bacteria in our gut allows us to digest our food. It, uh, we wouldn't be able to absorb certain vitamins without it. It modulates our immune system. It, it has a, a, an enormous positive impact. So taking antimicrobials unnecessarily isn't just about resistance that happens to someone else. It's about something that's bad for you if it's unnecessary. Interesting. So we need to personalize it so that it's relevant to the individual 
and we need to think about, well, how can I live in a holistic way as a healthy person? So it's much more about preventative measures, about uh, personal hygiene, about vaccination, and uh, approach, you know, good nutrition. And, um, and then if you have an infection that your body is unable to eradicate itself with your own robust immune system, well then you go in and you get antimicrobials to help mm. fight that infection. Yeah. So different approach. Yeah. And what, uh, what was, uh, sorry, I don't know if, if my mic is on now either, but uh, what, was, what was interesting is when, you know, when Vita, when, when Vita and I were talking about this initially, you know, and I was going, ooh, I guess I, well, actually that, that kind of, and it wasn't, that, like I had a different idea initially, but the Vita's actually then resonated with other stuff that I've been thinking about. And then we sort of move over to the other couch. And boy, if it resonated with me, it seriously resonated with the, the, with the other two. Because, it's, <laughs> it's, it, because this is what Nula has been uh, you know, talking about for ages in terms of the under the weather approach. It's Martin's Twitter handle is not evil Monus. Um, so, they, you know, so we actually you know, found this idea that, uh, and as Michael said, in, you know, in the space of just a couple of minutes, you know, we were all sort of saying, oh, you know what we could do, oh, we could do, we could do, you know, and you could see it was already, you know, uh, sort of taking shape in terms of a sort of a, a, a more of a sort of a common approach. So. Yeah. Uh, and I've used that, I teach medical students, and I've used a lot of Michael's approaches in my teaching, depending on the group, but you saw how it changed the energy of the room, just doing something very yeah. simple that was productive. Um, Final comments, I, Michael? I was just going to say, imagine what that would feel like if we also had a couple pregnant women who started to interact with you as well, where that might go. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how their behavior and thoughts about antibiotics might change and how they might go then on Facebook and talk about that. And you just see these things starting to build in a very viral fashion, but it'll never happen if you don't make the connections. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just very quickly, do you want to tell them, has anybody, everybody heard about Triz? No, because this is no. Don't we do it. We'll do just it tell them because this totally stumps people. It's brilliant. Okay, so the, we we call this the gateway liberating structure because healthcare providers have so much fun with it. So imagine going on to a ward. Let's say you're working on um, C. difficile, going on to a ward and saying to whichever staff have managed to get together <laughs> in the room, how would we give everybody C. difficile and kill them? What would we do? Yell out your ideas. What would 100% of the time Everybody gets C. diff, everybody dies. Yell it out. They start yelling out, don't clean the rooms, don't wash our hands, give everybody meropenem forever, make sure that you hide the, the, the metronidazole, don't do this, don't do that, never test them, never isolate them, don't use barrier precautions, all these things. You write them all down. Second step is, which of these things are we currently doing right now? And the answer is usually about 80% of them. And then the third step, is there anything that's within your power right now that you could stop doing or start doing that would make this problem a little bit better? So if you're a hospital cleaner, you may look at it and say, oh, I just suddenly realized how important my job is. Nobody ever told me that because people don't tend to talk to me, but now I know my job's really important. And if I'm the person who's filling the soap or whatever, I realize that's important. And if I'm a, uh, a nurse, I may realize that I should be um, tracking people's stools patterns better and I should be isolating them if they develop diarrhea, I should be asking to get them tested. If I'm a physician, I may be saying I should quit using broad spectrum antibiotics, it goes on and on and on. And that's what we've used to get people to start going down pathways to improve falls or to improve uh, uh, mortality from sepsis or whatever it is. That's one of the ways that we've engaged them and it works really well. Thank you. And you, uh, those of you that know me know I'm kind of bad-minded, so I like that. I like taking people. So when you rock onto a ward and go, how do you make sure nobody washes their hands? People are like, oh, right. <laughs> so listen, um, I just want to, Michael, you're allowed to sit right, down. Sit down, down again. Okay, that, that was an example of the art of delegation, by the way, in case nobody <laughs> noticed that. Um, but listen, I think we are going to draw this session to a close and hand over to Philip Crowley. But before I do, I just want to thank everybody that's been involved involved in it. Nina, Kathy, Catherine, Michael, Rob, Vida, Nula and Martin. Um, thank you very much. We've gone from the apocalypse to bat back to the apocalypse to hopefully two or three useful tricks that you can try when you go back to your ward so, or wherever you work. So thank you very much.